Sorry. What's up guys, it's Nurse Howie. It is CRNA Day Shadow 4. And there is a giant looming question coming up and that you should be able to answer by the end of this day. Uh, you don't have to have it, but I definitely found out that it is the reason why I was shadowing. And here are some of the things that I found out. Now that we've been able to shadow for a couple of days, we're going around 30 hours for me. Now not everybody has to do some shadowing for about 30 or 40 hours, but for me, I did. And this is what I found out. So, as I approach my fourth day of CRNA shadowing, I'm starting to notice some things and you start to realize the big picture. Now this is huge. This is the second most important thing I've learned during this time, okay? And then the most important thing I'll finish up at the end of the video, but definitely the second most important thing is just the general layout and not just of the operating room, let me tell you, but the whole experience of your patient because why are we here? The whole reason why we're here is because we're supposed to take care of the patient. We're supposed to be able to make sure that the patient gets a nice, good anesthesia enough so that they get a good, safe, and effective procedure and then you wake them back up and they wake up and they're pleasant and they're happy and the procedure is over and they get to go home and live an amazing life thanks to you and your team. Okay, so definitely, definitely, definitely gotta make sure that I understand exactly how the patient starts off in the pre-operating room area and then how the patient is transferred down the hallway to your operating room, which you should have prepared by now. And I've talked about that in the previous videos. So, yeah. <laughs> here and here for the CRNA day one, two, and three. More like two, CRNA day videos day two and three. And then during the procedure, you need to be able to figure out how to troubleshoot your patient. And then I'll kind of dive into that a little bit later on too in this video. And then after that, bring them back to the, you know, bring them out of the operating room and into the PACU, which is the post anesthesia care unit, where the patient will wake up and hopefully be in a, a lovely pain-free status and ready to go home or at least to a unit where they, he or she can recover. So again, that's the big picture. You really wanna be able to see where you are in this whole general area. Because you're not one person, you're not one island in anesthesia, you are a part of a team. And just because you fulfill an essential duty, does that mean that anybody else who's walking around you not doing your job is not as important. Because let me tell you, there are so many things that I found out that require things to be there in order for you to be able to make a perfect successful sedation and anesthesia for your patient. And even then, everything can still go south. And if that happens, it's your team and your preparation that's able to make the patient get out of that dangerous zone safely. So I saw that there's so many things that are going on that needs to be done. So I talked about this on CRNA Day 3, I think, is what you're basically trying to turn the tide of your patient's odds your favor, okay? So you're trying to make a good outcome for your patient. Unlike the surgeon, you're a little bit, I'm sorry for all the surgeons out there, but your ego is more on the realistic side so that you're more grounded in the fact that you know that you cannot control everything. And when that happens, it is our job as CRNAs and um, certified registered nurse anesthetists, or at least you know people who are trying to be like one, like me, um, and that all your odds are set up in a row so that they are in your patient's favor so that they can get out of it. And if anything bad happens, boom, 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 you got your stuff ready and everything's prepared to go. So even if you're not studying CRNA or going into CRNA school, when you're on the job training, you also kind of want to see that too. You'll start seeing the layout of the team, okay? 
All right, now that you've finished familiarizing yourself with the general layout of the operating room and you're not just kind of, because the first day is just like, blah, you know, you're just like, what's going on? What's that? What's this? What's that? What's this? Who are you? What are you doing? Where do I stand? Why can't I touch this, this, and that? You're past that now. You're past that from day one, day two. And you kind of know who's what, what they're doing, and why you can only go on this place or stand there and you know, why you're shadowing and how you introduce yourself and when you shut up and let the team do their pre-surgery, um, you know, meeting and whatnot. So you kind of know where you're at in the game. And you, just like as I talked about, you know the general layout, not just of one room, but of the entire adventure that the patient is going to go through. So the whole experience, including the pre-operation, during the operation, and then post-operation, okay? So now, I'm not saying, okay, I gotta, I gotta preface this with a, with a disclaimer. I'm not saying you're gonna be perfect because I say this to new nurses in the ICU all the time as well. I'm not saying you're gonna be perfect, but you can kind of start to see the troubleshooting that goes into taking care of a patient that you know it's not doing well, okay? So I've seen a couple of cases where the patients did not do great, okay? Oh, is that Siri? I just activated Siri. Could you try again? Siri, not now. So there's a couple of cases where patients don't do great and you wanna be able to make sure that you can monitor the patient. So this is where ICU skills come in and I kinda of start to recognize that, you know, like you, your ear starts kind of like bloop, bloop, you know, it's, you, as an ICU nurse, your ears always like kind of like rabbit ears, right? You learn to tune out the things that are okay. You know, like when you hear the pulse ox, it's always like beep, 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 beep. It's super annoying in the beginning, but after about like five, 10 minutes, you kind of forget about it. But then you also don't completely ignore it, but you train your brain and it's seeing that, uh oh, this patient's heartbeat is kind of slow or it's a little bit fast and when you're just kind of like sitting there monitoring the patient and then you're talking to somebody or you're trying to pass the time, then you look at the monitor and you're like, oh, that patient's heart rate is not doing too good. Is this patient one in pain? Is this patient starting to wake up, which is not good? Is this patient not tolerating the procedure or is this patient having an allergy or malignant reactions? You know, something terrible, okay? So, or are they just kind of dehydrated or do they need a Foley catheter or do they just need to be replaced and repositioned? So you kind of see how these experienced CRNAs change stuff around um, to be able to optimize their patient. So again, if you're not a CRNA and you're doing on the job training or if you're a nurse, you kind of, um, and you want to relate to what I'm saying, then you are on the, imagine yourself you're on the job training, then you start to see after a while, not only the layout of the organization, but also how some people react to things that are not exactly ideal, you know? So you're trying to build up this whole database in your mind about how the unit Respond. So you're trying to uh, basically this word that we're trying to find is like unit culture, right? Is what us nurses like to call is the unit cool? Is the unit bad? Is the unit like too hyper reactive? Or not necessarily bad, but is this how they react to things? That's the unit culture. Is this how they deal with things? Or is this how units are? So you transfer that skill and take it to the surgical area, arena, and then you kind of see how, oh, you know, surgeon's gonna react this way. You kind of have to switch it up to different surgeons if you're not used to working with one surgeon. You know, because I see that a lot of CRNAs switch around, they switch surgeons, they don't always get the same um, surgeons, and of course we don't get the same patients, you know, they don't get repeat surgeries. So you kind of have to kind of switch things up and see how the unit culture is managing. So you have to read people really quick and then use that to be able to optimize how your patient is doing. So I can optimize, optimize, optimize. That's number. The next thing, a part of optimization is relationships. Now that you kind of start to feel your, your place in the hierarchy, again, part of the properties of unit culture, uh, you kind of want to start talking to people other than just your CRNA. Of course, your CRNA preceptor is your number one because you are, of course, shadowing her or him and you need to be able to watch them like a hawk. But sometimes you kind of want to keep a third eye <laughs> 
on other people like the operating room nurse, the surgeon, the surgeon's assistant, stuff like that. So you want to be able to make sure that you can see how they operate as well so that if you need anything or if anybody needs help and you can kind of anticipate if somebody's trying to you know starting to drown or something like that or some you know so you can kind of anticipate things that might trouble that might start going your way but also when you form relationships you also create a sense of team a sense of community and when my preceptor, she would say hi to the, the surgical techs, of course, they're very important, but so are the operating room nurses, the circulating nurses, they're shadowing you know, and precepting people too. It's always nice to be pleasant to them. Introduce yourself first. That's the number one thing also, by the way. Introduce yourself first, just say, hi, I'm Howie. I'm shadowing this lovely CRNA. I am hopefully becoming a SRNA student. Well, maybe not be that thorough, but just be like, hi, I'm Howie, I'm just here shadowing. Um, if I'm in your way, please let me know. Um, I would love to learn, uh, if you have anything for me to, that you wanna you know, tell me about the operating room, I'd love to learn a little bit about your experiences too, um, you know, if you have time. But um, again, if there's anything I can do to help you, please let me know. I'm, I, I can't touch the patient yet <laughs> because I'm just shadowing, but um, I can move equipment around for you or get out of your way or anything like that. So, you know, let me know. You know, things like that. And not even nursing or healthcare or medical or surgical um, personnel relationships aren't the only ones that are important in the OR. There's also people who are taking care of the anesthesia machine. The anesthesia machine is so important. It's like your whole career. But it's also important for people to take care of the machine as well. Not only do you operate on it, but there's actual techs that take care of the machine. They clean it up, they test it for you. Of course, you have to do your own tests, I found, because you're gonna be still liable for it. But they'll test your machine ahead of time um, before you even go inside the operating room. And then you come in there and you test it again yourself. So there's an extra layer of security there and you want them on your side because if anything goes wrong, you need a new pipe or a screw or a bolt or something, I don't know, <laughs> as the machines that much yet. Uh, you want to be able to have them on your side and be able to call them and say, Hey, Natasha, or Hey, Sam, could you help me out? My machine's kind of acting up. And they'll be like, right away, I'll tell you what's wrong. This is it, blah, blah, blah. And then you can go about your merry business. You know, you don't have to cancel the case. You don't have to freak out the surgeon because they got to find a new room, all that stuff. You know, the very, again, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So you want to make sure that you are nice to people. Another thing too is that you want to see number one the style of your CRNA. Um, he or she is probably amazing because they are lovely enough to kind of let you shadow them, and you should be always very grateful. By the way, make sure you write thank you cards too. You know, I'll talk about that later. But always write thank you cards and remember their names of the people that shat, uh, that precepted you. Please, please, please remember their names. Write a list down so you can write them thank you cards but as you shadow your CRNA if they are nice enough I mean my mom was so awesome that she's like hey look this is like a boring routine to her it was boring to me it was amazing but she's like this is gonna be a boring um, ortho routine you've seen this one already or this is just you know this is not even gonna be general anesthesia this is gonna be more of like a quick 10 minute surgery why don't you go see a pediatric case anesthesia or a unique anesthesia case just down on this you know down the hallway in this operating room I went and talked to them and they said it was okay for you to shadow just you know be nice and just kind of stay out of the way and you know try to learn something so she let me go to a different operating room and uh, talk, of course talked it over with the CRNA first and let me shadow them. And I learned different styles of CRNAs. And let me tell you, they have completely different personalities. But the one thing that they do still have in common is that when things go wrong, they have their stuff online. I'm telling you, they always have their equipment where they need it to be. It's not always the same place that everybody else has it. But when they know that they need to have the suction, it's there. When they need to have that Mac 4 blade, it's there. When they need to have a Miller blade for their babies, they have it there. When they need to have the um, their medications, their um, norepinephrine or phenylephrine or whatever that's there. They know where it is and they know what to do because they've done it a million times and they are very professional. So they can be, 
they can have the most ostentatious personalities, but one thing that they do have in common is that they know how to react. And they know how to do it professionally, and they know how to do it right, and they know where their equipment is. They are the very essence of a professional, and that is why I like CRNAs. <laughs> and, you know, any other professionals that didn't have to be healthcare related, um, if you're trying to choose a career and you're shadowing and you're on the job training, you want to see and you hopefully get to mentor somebody that is somebody that you want to emulate. And when you emulate them, you see what makes them so good. And you don't have to follow any healthcare industry, but you can also follow anybody that's like even artistic or on the creative side. You know, they they know how to how to create a zone. You know, it might not be as um, let's say uh, pr uh, uh, specific or as accurate, but you know, like let's say in the creative industry, they they know how to make things ideal and optimize things to make things their kind of a zone you're going to want to try to do that you know whether or not whatever job that you're trying to um, get into and what industry you're trying to get into and that's what i'm trying to emulate myself well, a couple of stories just to kind of like put things into perspective there's three stories that kind of help me open my eyes to about the not so pretty side of uh, being a CRNA and being in the operating room. Now, the one thing I was told, I told you on day one, is that I was scared that I didn't belong in the operating room, and that is the main topic, the main question, the main conversation of this whole video is that why am I shadowing? No, you're not just putting hours into your application so that you can just send it off into the school. Uh, CRNA school and then get in and that's it. No, you're shadowing because you're trying to figure out whether or not CRNA school is for you. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you at the very end of the reveal that what I feel I got of Mr. Shadow Experience. Actually, I'm going to put up my day five, but I'll give you a little bit of a hint. Shadowing showed me the not so pretty aspects of being a CRNA. And I know that everybody goes into CRNA because they're like, oh, it's a better quality of life. You have, you know, more chances to make money. But, you know, we also get more student loans. We get more racked up debt. You know, you'll always be working as yourself. You know, you can't teach somebody and train them and then have them work for you. And then, you know, you get part of their pay or salary. No, you have to be the CRNA in the operating room sitting there. These three stories show that a little bit of the ugly side of CRNA and there's no good, perfect job out there. And this is also why it's important to shadow. One, being unprepared. There was this unprepared uh, intern or resident, I don't know. She was lovely, she was brilliant, I can tell. But she did not have good street sense. For example, when uh, my CRNA was actually shadowing both her and me, and so I think this resident was just happy to have somebody else like below her because she was kind of in, you know, lower in the totem pole. She wasn't the lowest because medical student, you know, she's they're just like me shadowing. But um, to her, to me, I was lower than her in her, in her mind. So when we went to go to pre-assess the patient and the CRNA wasn't there, she's like, oh, well, this is an IV and this is... IV tubing, and this is what we put in the patient, so let me show you how to, and I'm like, this, <laughs> really? <laughs> like, it said on my badge, RN, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I felt like she didn't put two and two together, so like, I like, flipped it around, like, bloop, you know, <laughs> like, I didn't want to just say like, hey, I'm an RN, stop it, but I was just like, I'm an RN, you know, <laughs> like, but she didn't really get that. Anyway, uh, she got her comeuppance when we were going from case to case and these, I guess some of these ortho um, cases happen like really quick. So they go boom, 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 in and out, like three operating rooms in a row. So we finish one and go another one, go another one. It's like 30 minutes to not even an hour. So we go on another one and maybe I think um, this resident was a little bit overwhelmed. She was actually, this was actually not her specialty. She was just going to, she was going to, she's going to be a surgeon, but um, ortho wasn't her specialty. So maybe she wasn't, I think she was just overwhelmed, but even though, but again, let me preface it by saying that she was brilliant, but she just wasn't aware 
maybe she was tired, something. Anyway, so we weren't able to uh, anesthetize the patient. The patient was just kind of um, resisting. And so she was starting to have trouble because she was supposed to be starting the anesthesia on a patient and this patient was not having it. <laughs> and the patient wasn't crashing, but it's this patient was just kind of in and out, drifting in and out of sleep and not quite getting the breaths in. So of course, um, my CRNA preceptor came in from behind her and be like, hey, look, like, what do you need? Like, let's, let's get this going. Let's retry that, that intubation again. What do you need? And the resident was grabbing for stuff and she was like, ah, blah, blah, squeezing the APL bag and turning the APL bag. I just like really didn't know what it was. I didn't really know that she was clueless at the time, but the CRNA was just like, get out. You know, and she just kind of shoved her to the side, didn't kick her out of the operating room, but just kind of like quietly but forcefully took over, you know, like, kind of just like moved her hands out of the way and you know started slight lightly squeezing the um the bag valve and that's remy he's making some sounds uh making the bag valve pre-oxygenating the patient a little bit and then um, increasing the sedation on the propofol and then changing the SIBO and um, making sure that she was ready to try again so that was a apparently a very very very, very useful skill to be able to rebag the patient and to try to do the intubation again. And she would have let the resident try again, but the resident was not prepared. The resident, and I learned this afterwards when the, when the resident was basically kicked out. So off to the side, luckily she didn't do it in front of everybody, but the CRNA was just like, all right, you need to go out, you need to get some lunch, and you, you know, figure this ish out because you did you were unprepared. So then I kind of asked like, wh what happened? So the CRNA was like, well, this is what happened. The patient is not doing well. The patient was not going under anesthesia and the patient was starting to become hypoxic. You know, it didn't seem like it at first, but you can see the numbers were starting to fall. The, what really tipped, tipped the, the balance uh, toward where the resident got dismissed was because there was no extra equipment. And again, I talked about this in CRNA day um, two and three, but the application of being prepared is MS made. So you have to make sure that all your airways and intubation equipment is there, but not only there and prepared and kind of like not all open, but the ones that you use, you know, ready to go. But you also have to have an extra one up or one down size in case one size just doesn't fit and she wasn't ready, and she said she was, so she lied, so she was dismissed. Uh, the next case was a bleeder. Uh, so we were taking care of a, a patient during an ENT, which is ear, nose, and throat surgery, and we were almost done, but everybody was just kind of like in pins and needles because it's just like right in the ear, and it's a very small area to operate in, <laughs> very small. And I, But I could see it on the screen, and it was huge, to me, so I was like, what's the problem? But then I looked in real life and looked down at the surgeons, just sort of like little teeny tiny little things and things were going well, but I think maybe it just took a little too long um, and the patient's ear started bleeding and the surgeon screamed because she was not happy. And I can kind of, and I saw on the TV why, because that little bleed that didn't seem like it was that big of a deal flooded the entire ear. So it made the surgery almost impossible. The surgeon assistant was just like sucking blood, blah, 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 out of there. And it didn't seem like much. It was a small area, but it bloods enough that it started to affect the patient's vital signs monitor. So yeah, it changed a lot of things too. So we had, we ended up staying there for an extra hour and the, pa the surgeon was screaming at everybody the whole time. And every time we try to ask the surgeon a question, like how long do you think it'll take? And is there anything else you need? Um, no, the patient's not moving, it's more you. <laughs> she would flip out. So yeah, get used to that. Things don't go the way as planned. And then also, oh, I, I talked about the, the re-airway bagging. So, um, and why that's an important skill. So, Final thoughts, guys and gals. If you are not in the healthcare field, here are some things that you can learn. Um, 
At this point in time, when you're almost done with your shadowing, but not quite, you should be able to have gained a little bit of confidence. Now, I know not everybody's like a super duper confident or self, like, you know, self, what's the word here? You know what I'm talking about. People who are um, as confident in themselves, um, who aren't walking around all day and with high self-esteem, you know, but you should at least gain a little bit of confidence in your place in this job. Do you feel like you're gonna be able to fit in? Do you feel like this is, more importantly, do you feel like this is a job that you would like and be competent in, okay? This is why you're shadowing. And then number two, learning the hierarchy, learning the unit culture, is it something that you can establish yourself in, but also establish meaningful relationships? Would you like to be able to work with these people? And would these people like to be able to work with you, you know? And then number three, develop a baseline general knowledge. If things go wrong, Will you be able to see how the unit reacts to things? And then if it reacts to things, how will you be able to contribute to that in order to make a better outcome for your patient or for your client? How can you make things better and how will your presence there be better? You don't necessarily need to have the answers to that, but you can at least see that, see where you can kind of get ideas and where you can put your foot in um, and start contributing. So final thoughts at this point, CRNAs, at least for me, uh, I am 75% understanding of my initial feelings about this career. Um, basically, is this a job that you'd want to get into? Is this a job that you want to put $200,000 of debt into, including compounding interest? Is this something that you want to spend three years of your life in, putting your family on hold, your relationships on hold, and your social life on hold? Well, I don't really have a social life anyway, so that's not an issue. But is this something that you think you can do? Um, you should be 75% aware. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to say sure. I almost said sure. You should be 75% aware of your feelings about this job. And then you start to feel confident about your abilities. Again, where you fit in, how you can um, contribute to the unit culture, and whether or not it is something for you to do, and whether or not you can hang out with these people during the day. You don't have to hang out with them at night. I'm not a big proponent of after work socializing. Um, and then you can gain hope that if this is the right job for you, that is you're making the right career path and you're making a better life for you um, and your family, but definitely for you first, because if you're not taking care of you, you won't be able to take care of your family and you'll just be miserable, okay? And on the other side of that token is that if you don't, want to get into this field, whether or not it's CRNA or, or whatever job that you're trying to get into that you're shadowing or getting on the job exposure to, be hopeful that this is a good step in that you avoided a possible bad decision. You know, you dodged a bullet, you know, so be happy and hopeful that you chose a good direction either way which way you want to go, okay? So I hope you guys got a little bit more confident. I hope you guys got a little bit more hopeful. And I hope you learned some things today. Thank you for coming with me on this journey. If you liked what you've seen, comment, like, and subscribe. I'm gonna put some more information. Um, check out my website at www.nursehowie.com. Um, I'm gonna put a little, some courses and some notes and information there for you to download. Um, check out my Instagram at Nurse Howie or at Howie Real if you want to check out my social life. I don't know why. And then, um, yeah, please hit that notification bell, comment, subscribe, and I will see you later. Thanks, guys. Bye.